several have been so kind, said that you'd really enjoyed uh, this brief series, and it's ended up being much longer than what I expected. Um, I'm almost through point number one, <laughs> so anyhow, it's amazing how that happens. And I was thinking, I was talking to Martha earlier uh, today, and I just said, you know, I have a series that I wrote years ago, back about 25 years ago, on Joseph. And it was actually 54 lessons, so anyhow, uh, Joseph was a fantastic man, as many of you know, uh, that I used it with our young people. And so it might be something to be appropriate to do like we're doing right now. So I've been excited to teach on uh, Wednesday nights uh, concerning Gideon, and then of course Sunday night also, time all together. And uh, so we'll just see what God does and several other things going on. And, uh, Pray that this concerning uh, getting the windows fixed, that we'll get that down here uh, maybe even tomorrow and uh, talk to Cindy. We'll need some help, maybe taking the doors out a couple other nights, and uh, we'll see what we can do on that. Anyhow, I just wanted to mention that. So if you would look in Judges chapter 6, and as we look here, we've already covered a number of the verses, uh, all the way through verse 15, and then we're uh, sharing some other verses with you. And so now I want to talk to you about Gideon. Uh, he asked for a sign from God. And many times I've had people ask me questions like, uh, Preacher, is there some way I can get a sign from God, what I should do right now? And I guess just a moment ago, actually, Brother Ed Taylor and I were kind of talking along those lines too about knowing what God's will is for our lives and where he would have us to go and what he would have us um, to say and, and to follow in his leading force. But as we make the terms of asking for a sign, uh, sometimes people say, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing or whatever? Well, I, I trust as we share with you here in just a moment that you'll be able to, to learn something, the importance of knowing God's will. And uh, many times we uh, may look for some sort of sign to help us know that we're headed in the right direction or help us know that we need to turn around and go in another direction. And so simply here, we might remember verse 22, and when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face, and the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Isn't it interesting how many times when angels appear, one of the first statements you hear from the angels is, Fear not! <laughs> and over and over again, we can see, you see or hear those words, Fear not! And uh, so when he finally realized this guy wasn't just an ordinary person, this was an angel. And I saw him face to face. And again, uh, we see there was a little bit of excitement, but there was concern. I think even in his mind, uh, wow, I'm going to die <laughs> because I've seen an angel. And so there was some fear that came upon him. And again, uh, God made it very clear that he didn't need the fear. And he said, just go ahead and, and I want to give you peace at this time. And in an interest that that always seems the time when they see an angel too, that the Lord says, fear not, peace unto you. That's the next thing that you hear. And what are we doing? We're looking at a messenger from God. And every one of us at one time or another have played the part of an angel. And some of you say, well, uh, preach, I don't know. I've never been in one of those plays or whatever. But what I'm saying is we've all been a messenger from time to time. That's exactly what an angel is. And so as we look at this angel, as he speaks uh, to Gideon, we see his excitement when he realized that God has sent a special messenger to him to help him to know that he's been called to do something special for God. And so we see the excitement. And Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord, and he called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day is it yet there in Ophrah and unto the Ezerites. So we see that he went ahead and he built an altar when he realized God sent me a special messenger. And, and folks, isn't it exciting to realize that God has all sent us a special messenger? And when I think of it, let me rephrase that God has all sent us all a special message. And we have God's word as a special message that's been given to us to help lead us in our daily walk, to help us to know how that we can please God and how God can work in our lives in a miraculous way as we read his word. And then I said, God has sent you a personal love letter. And it's something, there's something in there for you, special every single day that you read it and look into it. God has a special message for you. So here we find that he built an altar called Jehovah Shalom. 
And uh, very interesting, just referring to the fact that God is my peace, that God is the one that's going to see me through this. And yet, when you look at the situation they was living in, it was anything but a peaceful situation. <laughs> I mean, they were basically at war. And when I say at war, they were being invaded by the Mennonites. And also you'll see the Amorites and the Amalekites and others had invaded them. And I don't know, can we identify with an invasion right now? And uh, I know when I was working in Texas, uh, one of the biggest problems we had in the county jail was illegal aliens. And what was frightening was how the majority of those aliens were caught and how that they were found to be doing wrong. And when I say that, again, I was working right there. I was involved in the, uh, the very situation. But 70% of the illegal aliens that we had in our county jail there in Monte County had been caught in a pedophile act. Folks, I don't know about you, but that bothers me to this day. I mean, it just really upsets me. And uh, the jailers there were very upset with it that these people had come into our country and that they were doing terrible things to children. And, uh, and, and yet now we see that our country said, oh, it's okay, they can do whatever they want. They don't even need to pay bail. It's okay, we get all these sanctioned cities and they can go to these sanctioned cities and they're okay and they can do all they want to. It's all right, because we'll, we'll forgive them immediately for whatever crime they might do. Uh, folks, that's sick. That's sad. And that's frightening. But you find that when the world gets in control, <laughs> the world, their standards are not the same as ours. The world looks at abortion and says, hey, that's a good thing because uh, this face is inconvenient to have the baby when you're that young, you know, and you're trying to get your, your life together and everything, and there's just not time for a baby now. So get rid of it. I mean, it's almost like, well, if you get a cold, go ahead and take some vitamins. Get rid of that cold, okay? You know, it's just so nasty. It's going to be such an inconvenience. So it, it's okay to have an abortion. It's just fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not murder. It's just tissue. They finally realize that that sounds so phony and that they're saying a little bit different now that, that there is some life, but you know, anyhow, how sad. So as we look at the situation here, we see that the world was in control and they were dictating to the people of God how to run their lives. And well, maybe I should say how to ruin their lives, okay. But as they were, what did they do? They introduced Baal to the people. And God has specifically told him, he said, do not worship the gods of the land that you're going into. Do not worship those gods. Because, and, and they said, don't have anything to do with God. Because if you do, they will destroy you and your children will also be destroyed. Folks, we find right now in our country, it's sad they're teaching things that they refer to as uh, critical race theory. It's being taught at West Point right now, as I'm speaking. They're doing everything to encourage people to uh, if they're from another race to hate the white people for all the terrible things that they've done to this world and if you're a white person you should be ashamed of what your ancestors did before you <laughs> folks uh, I, I'm sorry I, I can't be responsible for what my grandfather and my great grand I can't be responsible for what my father did so how dare them tell us that but what I'm looking at is what are you doing now what are we doing and, and again, it's just amazing how they're trying to divide our country uh, by races and other things. It's just unbelievable the division that we have in our country. In fact, uh, I saw an article, I think it was today or maybe it was yesterday, and it just said, it's still saying the United States, it said the divided states of America. And we are seeing that and that is very, very much true. And what's sad is we look here, you don't realize it, that the Mennonites, that there were actually many Israelites that had sided with them, that had become involved in them. Uh, and, and so anyhow, very frightening, but that's how it happens. Those that are in leadership, oftentimes people will follow them because they say, well, he's the man, he's the boss, he's in charge. And they'll follow them even if they're not following God. And how sad and what a tragedy. So verse 25 says, And it came to pass that same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, and again, one since you might look at this as, uh, you know, take his John Deere tractor, okay? <laughs> take the young bullock, he says, thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, 
and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father had, and cut down the grove that is by it. So now this is getting really personal, and this is getting kind of scary, because God has asked him to go against what his father has done. And folks, how sad that his father, who should have been leading his son in the right direction, but he had completely turned to the system of the world. And, and folks, how many of us know people that maybe once had a godly testimony and they had a walk with God, but now they're, they're so involved in the world that you can't tell any difference between them and, and the world. I mean, they're doing the same thing that the world is and they think it's okay. How many people have been sold on abortion? That it is okay, it's not that bad. How many people have been sold on, it's okay to go ahead and use marijuana and, and if you want, you can use it for medicinal purposes too, but there's really nothing wrong. There's no worse than beer. Uh, folks, did you know there's something wrong with beer? <laughs> the Bible says clearly in Proverbs 20 verse one, it says, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raisin, and whosoever deceived thereby is not wise. So those things are bad, folks. They really are. And we need to stay away from those things. But what happens just a little, little by little, these things come in. And, and what's sad is, you know, little by little, these things come into our life. And what happens is we're, we were way over here, you know, and this would be, you're right. We were way over here, but little by little, we moved this way, this way, until finally we were more over here than we were here. And what a tragedy. When Christians get off center, we find so many of our churches that are being closed down right now because people have gotten so far away from God. But it says that he went ahead, he took his father's oxen, he went ahead and tore down his father's altar to Baal. <laughs> now, I, I don't know about you, but uh, don't you think his father may get a little upset with him? Uh, I, I think that we're looking at a family feud fixing to happen here. But folks, I want to tell you, when we do what's right, it's amazing how many people will, and, and usually use this term different, but how many people will come out of the closet when you do right? What I'm saying, it is sad that many Christians go into the closet, and yet God has told us that when we pray, we should pray in the closet, not so everybody can hear us go, wow, what a wonderful prayer, man. I felt like I was brought just before the throne when you prayed, and, and maybe so. But many times what's happened is Christians have just, they've just flowed with the, with the world. And when a Christian stands up and does right, people go, you know, that's the right thing. And they'll even go so far as to say, you know, I really should be doing the right thing too. And I, I'm ashamed of what I've been doing. But it takes a Christian standing up and doing the right thing even knowing that punishment and all sorts of other things can happen to him for doing that. So he goes on, says that thy father hath and cut down the grove that is by it. Uh, by the way, Gideon, you know what his name means? It means hewer or cut down. Uh, isn't it interesting that of all things, his father named him hewer and what he do, he hewed down the grove and hewed down the, uh, the worship to Baal. And then it goes on, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock. Now, can you imagine? Everybody went to bed that night. <laughs> and when they went to bed, maybe they said their whatever's to, uh, you know, to Bell. And they wake up the next morning, and there's an altar to Jehovah God. <laughs> wow, that happened fast. By the way, wasn't it fast? How fast the Supreme Court put down abortion and said that abortion by the United States was illegal and that the United States would no longer fund it. Wow. I mean, what a surprise in the midst of all the things that have been happening that that happened. Well, could it be like an altar being built to the Lord where Bell's altar was? <laughs> wow. So we know what, <laughs> that some things are fixing to happen, right? You're right. So again, he says, and he built an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove, which thou shalt cut down. And Gideon took 10 men of his servants. Now, th this kind of tickles me because you remember when he was talking to the angel, he said, I'm basically the runt of the runt family of the runt tribe of Israel. And we're very poor. 
it says here he had at least 10 men servants that we know of. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? He said, we're poor. I only have 10 servants that I can use tonight. And by the way, I wonder how many of his servants that he knew that they would they would work with him. And how many servants, how many other servants were there? So in it, it may sometimes that we sell ourselves short. But notice as he went on, and he said, uh, these ten men of his servants, and did as the Lord had said unto him. And there's the key, he did what God told him to do. Folks, when we read God's word, you know what? It usually becomes pretty clear what we're supposed to do. God makes it very clear. He's given us a commission to go out and to reach the world for Christ. He's given us a commission to reach those that are lost and bring them to the saving knowledge of Jesus. Really, backing up just a hair. When we talk about asking for a sign, too many people ask God for signs when the sign of salvation is really enough. Man, just getting saved, isn't that fantastic? I'm saved and I'm going to heaven, not because I'm good, but because God is good. God forgave me of all my sins. And you say, well, what do you mean by all your sins? I mean, he forgave me of all my past sins, all my present sins, and all my future sins. Wow! But folks, there's no other way I can go to heaven unless he did that. Isn't it fantastic that our God is so great that he can take care of all sin? Wow. The only sin is the sin of unbelief. That's what sends us to hell. And so as we look here very closely, Gideon took his ten servants, and it says that he, he said unto them, the Lord had said unto him, and so it was because he feared his father's household and the men of the city, that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. Uh, Some said, well, the angel was referring to him. Remember what the angel said? Hell thy mighty man of valor. <laughs> he, he was hiding out, doing something that needed to be more out in the open, if you please, but because of the, the position he'd been placed into by the world. And folks, the world's going to do all sorts of things to hinder us, uh, if you please, to handcuff us, to keep us from doing what we need to do as Christians. And there's really nothing to do about that. That's always happened. The world's going to do what they can to hinder us. They're going to do what they can to put a muzzle on us or a muffler on us. But let me point this out. Even though he knew his father was probably more likely to be very upset with him, very upset, and he knew that the men of the city would definitely be upset with him, he knew that he was looking at his life being ended. Folks, he really, really stepped out by faith, did he not? But now what gets me is he went ahead and did what God told him to do, even in the night. <laughs> you know? And you can say, well, how terrible. You know, he waited till night so they couldn't see what he was doing. He went ahead and he did it, though. That's the thing. He did it. Folks. God called us to do. And if it be at night, <laughs> just do it. Just do it. He did it. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, and behold, the altar of Bell was cast down, and the grove was cut down, that was by. Him. The second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And they said one to another, Who hath done this thing? How dare they? Must have been a Republican. <laughs> Definitely wasn't a Democrat. <laughs> uh, whatever. Okay. Uh, must have been a Trump or something. But anyhow, they were upset. And he knew that was going to happen. And folks, let's face it. We do something for God. The world's not going to say right behind, Oh, man, that's so wonderful what you did. Oh, God bless you for what you did. <laughs> God bless you for what you said. God bless you for doing right when nobody else was. <laughs> okay. So, that where we were. And when they said one to another, who hath done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, hath done this thing. And that funny, he lived up to his name, Cure of Wood. <laughs> Cut down. Okay. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, that's his father, 
bring out thy son that he may die because he hath cast down the altar of Baal and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. Folks, they were not happy with him. <laughs> they weren't happy campers if you please. But I want you to see what happened. And how many times have I shared it with people that if you do what God's asked you to do, We've seen it over and over again. Somebody comes forward in the church because they've been saved and they come to make it public. They come to present themselves for baptism. But how many times have we seen other people move out that we didn't know that God was working in their hearts or whatever, but because they saw somebody else step out, it was just that enough of a push and encouragement for them to do the right thing. Here's what it says. And Joash said unto all that stood against him. Who was against him? All the men of the city is what it said. They were against him. There wasn't anybody for him what he did. I mean, they were against him. Okay. And it says, will ye plead for Baal? Is what Joash's father said. Will you save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death. Well, said it's yet morning. If he be a God, let him plead for himself because one hath cast down his altar. Did you catch that? If Baal is really a God, let him take care of himself. And if you're for Baal, you need to be put to death. Wow. This was Joash's grove. This was Joash's Baal worship place. Listen to this guy. Isn't that exciting? His son did what was right, and it was enough to challenge him to do what was right too, what he knew he should have been doing all along. Instead, just flowing with the rest of the world. So much easier just to flow with the flow. Uh, what am I saying, folks? This there to do right. Therefore, on that day, he called him to rubble saying, let Baal plead against him because he had thrown down his altar. And, and that name is funny because I kept asking, <laughs> I kept asking Google what Jerubal mean. And the first thing that came was, oh, uh, Geronimo means mighty warrior. And I, uh, uh, Geronimo, how did I get it there, you know? <laughs> and then I tried saying it again and it came out, durable means. <laughs> and so it couldn't ever get what I was saying. So uh, finally, <clears throat> My wife came to my rescue to help me somewhat. But Jerubal, you read, here's what it means. I, I looked it up in my Strong's Concordance. And in my Strong's Concordance, it means this. It means, Bell will contend. And folks, here's the way I see it. When you do what's right, the devil's going to contend with you. And, and, and isn't that great? Isn't that exciting? And that the world is going to contend with you when you do what's right. And I can't make of a better identification to be identified as an enemy of the devil. Amen. I'm afraid that too many Christians today are content with just being a friend of the world. They're content with riding on the fence, if you please. Uh, I'll say. And so as we look here, the only sign we need is the sign of salvation. Jesus said it this way in John 20, verse 29, as he was talking to Thomas. And remember how Thomas said, I won't believe that Jesus has risen from the dead unless I can stick my hand in the side and see the nail prints and, and fill those. I just won't believe that he's really come. Y'all guys have all been hallucinating. I saw Jesus killed. He's dead. He's gone. And then Jesus appeared and he said, oh, my Lord, my God. Amen. And Jesus said unto him, Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. I mean, Thomas saw it all. He saw it all. And yet he had his doubts still. But Jesus said that we're more blessed than him. Because we believe without sin. And, and what I'm saying again, and I'm not trying to get too far away from what I've been talking about. But because of our salvation, we know that Jesus is real. We know that he can work in us because we've had him do it before. Gideon. Wow. How exciting as we look at his life and see God working through him. What does God's people 
have to do to get in the right place. And folks, I feel like every one of you tonight, you're in the right place. This is where you need to be right here in God's house with God's people. Hearing God's word as it's being shared with you. But we need to give up our idols. Whatever it is that we put before God, we need to get rid of it. And, and sometimes it may not make sense because it may be something that's good. You know, and, and really there's a lot of good things out there, but the best thing is the fall of God. And all those other good things, I mean, we need to do what God has called us to do. And that's to share the good news that Jesus saves. As they did in verse 25, they got rid of all those idols that were in their life. And you see, in an interesting when, when Gideon got rid of that, that idol that was in his life, it also took care of the idol that was in the life of everybody in the city <laughs> and his own family was affected by what he did. So Gideon destroyed the bell altar that night. He did it under the cover of night, but the next day it was clear what he did. And so folks, we need to follow his suit. Gideon gave the wood a bell to God, for God knows what to do with our idols. And God can take care of any idol that we might have in our life. We need to allow the Spirit of God to come upon them as it did Gideon, as it says so clearly uh, here in, in Judges chapter 6, verse 24, that God's Spirit came upon him when he gave up the spirit of the world. When he gave up the devil's spirit, God's Spirit was able to fill him. And it is sad that there's so many Christians that, folks, they're being led by the devil. There's people that should be here in church tonight that aren't because they've allowed the devil to lead them. And it might be something so, so minute. Maybe something like, well, my favorite TV program comes on. And what's amazing, in this day and time, you can actually record it. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's amazing the times that we live in. But, and then it's so easy to say, well, I'm tired after work. And, uh, you know, I, I bet DJs never tired after work. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just funny with her because she works very, very hard. But what am I trying to say? That, folks, we need to allow the Spirit of God to come upon us as it came upon Gideon. Gideon made a stand for God. And, folks, I think he was a little timid. He was a little concerned about it. He said, I'm still going to do it no matter what happens because God told me to do it. God wants me to do it. I will do it. And folks, if I even came to this place, if I died, I died for God. I did it in his service. Wow. And I think he truly did die to himself. But they must not be fearful and afraid to fight in God's army. And again, when you're being shot at and other things are happening, uh, notice what it says in verse 3 of chapter 7. Now, therefore, go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And they returned to the people 20 and 2,000, and there remained 10,000. So, again, just the person doing the right thing. There's still going to be people that are going to be afraid. But if we had confessions from Gideon right now, <laughs> It's a, I'm still afraid. I was afraid through the whole ordeal, through everything that was happening, through all the things that took place. But we know what God said here. Those that are fit, don't go ahead. Don't go home. And we'll work with those that stay behind. And so they, uh, again, as we look at it here, we see that God knew that if they were to win the victory of 32,000 people, that they said, look at what we did. And so God got him down to 10,000. And then, of course, you know, as the story goes on, finally, God gets him down to 300 against this multitude. And there's no way that, humanly speaking, that they could win this fight. But, folks, we got to remember that we may seem like a minority in this world, but if we're doing God's bidding, he's the majority. <laughs> okay? He's the majority, and God will bless us. They must be ready to fight in God's army. The man that uh, that came on to the special trial, we'll go ahead and uh, leave this for another time. But simply, we need to be where God wants us to be. And as I say that, that indicates 
that there's many people that are not where God wants them to be. And what a tragedy that so many people, they have refused to follow God's plan for them. And as a result, the devil's using them, the world's using them, their flesh is using them, when it could be God. Folks, I have never been proud when my flesh did something. I always end up being embarrassed. And when I had the world come and pat me on the back, this or that, I'm usually kind of embarrassed because maybe it means I did some compromise and I shouldn't have done. And, and what I'm saying is, folks, when we do things for God, there might be a little bit of embarrassment there or whatever because if I said, why did you do that? What were you thinking? And no doubt, Gideon's servants, the time that he was doing the 10 service, and hey, hey, boss man, you, uh, you think the big boss, your dad's going to be pleased with what we're doing right now? <laughs> and he said, I'm doing what God's told me to do. And they go, uh, oh, okay. And you just be sure to let your dad know that you forced us to do this. <laughs> you know, whatever. Uh, folks, I'm so glad that God looks for volunteers. And he wants to bless us. And how dare us do our own thing when God has given us his word. And we can know exactly what we need to do. And we don't need any other sign. In fact, I'm saved. I belong to God. And God wants to use me for his honor and for his glory. It just a matter of saying, okay, God, I don't understand everything about it, but I know what you say, and I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow you. Let me take care of everything else. Oh, wow, that's so exciting what God can do. We do. Would you stand to your feet as we begin our invitation? Lord, thank you for this time we can come together and study your word and help us as we think upon Gideon, the time that he lived and the things that he faced. And, and yet, his world seems so similar to the time that we're living in. It's just amazing how that it seems like history repeats itself. Lord, help us to follow Gideon's example even though he definitely had some fear and he had some doubts, he still did what you wanted him to do. Lord, help us with our fears and our doubts to relinquish them and to follow you with all of our heart, realizing that you know what's best for us and that what we do can affect the whole city, can affect this whole family, can affect so many and affect the enemies of God. Wow, they were the vast majority. And what a blessing it is that we can kick the devil in the teeth, that we can put him on the run when it looks like there's no way, no way. The devil's got this battle too. But we need to see that we have a great God. And the God that Gideon served is you. Lord, help us to, to see you through all the things that are coming our way. Help us to trust you when it seems like the battles are even lost. There's no hope. Help us to always keep our hope in you and not the things of this world or human reasoning. Thank you for loving us. Son's precious name we pray.